Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here, and uh, it's my pleasure to deliver some of our information to you. And I'll be uh, looking forward to engaging with you a bit later on this afternoon for our practical session. <clears throat> so, as you will have gathered from um, what you've been able to read about the abstracts and so on, and the title of the talk, so the, the focus of, of my research is on Parkinson's disease. And I've been working on this since uh, I started as a postdoc in 2001. And uh, this has led us, I was really, the driving force was just to understand a bit about the, the pathological causes of Parkinson's disease, but it's led us to be thinking a lot about mitochondria and how they stay healthy. And it just so happens that uh, the fly models have proven incredibly useful and incredibly informative for this. So if anyone, I, I didn't really have a, a clear um, uh, overview of, of people's backgrounds, so if anyone wants to stop me along the way to understand a specific point, feel free. Um, just you know, interrupt me if I don't see a hand go up. Uh, I'm quite happy to, to do that, or you can ask me specific questions at the end. <clears throat> so what I want to, to talk about is... Um, I'll first of all introduce you to our sort of um, give the basics about the disease and introduce you to our models primarily looking at the genes Pink One and Parkin. And what I wanted to focus on in, in, in this session, and this will inform the, the practical session later on, is how uh, for a little while now we've, we've sort of defined how Pink and Parkin genetically interact with, with the dynamic machinery of, of mitochondria. I'll explain what that's all about as we go through. <clears throat> and I'll tell you a little bit about what the, the, where the current field currently is for thinking about Pink One, Parkin, and this, this pathway that they've been linked in. And I'll finish up by describing a recent study that we published about um, analyzing this process of mitophagy in flights. Okay, so, and do I have a clock? I guess this one is more or less accurate, apart from an hour. So, uh, Parkinson's disease. The first, uh, to cover a few of the basic points about this, if you're not um, very familiar with it already, it's a common neurodegenerative disease uh, that primarily affects the uh, dopaminergic neurons of the substantia nigra and results in this locomotor motor, uh, syndrome, uh, rigidity, uh, stiffness of movement, and the, the classic sort of shaking tremors. So it should also be noted, while I said it's, it's primarily caused by loss of these dopamine neurons in the substantia nigra, other neuronal subtypes are affected, other brain areas are affected as well later on in the disease course. And pathologically, it's defined, because it can, it can look clinically like a lot of other syndromes, it's actually uh, defined uh, clinically by the pathological exam of post-mortem tissue, where you can see these uh, protonaceous aggregates that are called Lewy bodies in this particular disease. No doubt you'll know that these sorts of protonaceous aggregates are a common feature of uh, various neurogenitive diseases. And to quickly just sort of uh, introduce you to the fact that mitochondria dysfunction has been a long-standing uh, association with Parkinson's disease. Uh, since the, the late 80s, uh, deficiencies in the respiratory chain complex 1 uh, one complex in mitochondria has been noted, and um, mutations in the mitochondrial DNA have also been seen in postmortem tissues. And just a little before that, actually, uh, it was defined that a number of mitochondrial toxins uh, can lead to a Parkinson's-like syndrome in, in people. But it's really the cell biology of uh, the genes that have been linked to familial Parkinson's that have really solidified um, a central role for, for mitochondrial dysfunction in, in the disease. Now, of course, we're, uh, we're using flies. Flies are a fantastic genetic model organism. It's not the only thing they're good for, but our, in, in our uh, context, we're thinking about the genetics. So it's important to have a, a view of where your genetic model and your genetic experiments sit within the greater uh, scheme of a complex disease like, like Parkinson's disease. And Parkinson's is a complex disease, 
Um, but it has become um, <coughs> tremendously well defined for the genetic contribution over about the last 10 years. Now, this, this is a fairly busy slide that's been attempted to be summarized in a simple way, and I'll try and uh, summarize it myself. Um, but it breaks down like this. This group of, of genes up here are <coughs> genes that are linked to very clearly inherited forms of Parkinson's. Okay. Um, I, by the way, I can make uh, slides available to you afterwards, so you can save you taking photos and you can just sort of uh, absorb and listen. I can make slides available, that's not a problem. Um, so, so these genes up here are, are clearly linked to uh, um, familial forms of the disease, and that's relatively, relatively rare, okay? perhaps num uh, proportioning about 10% of all Parkinson's cases, okay? which leaves the other 90%, which I generally uh, refer to as sporadic. So what, what uh, the human geneticists do is go, go using these genome-wide association studies to look for SNPs that are associated with the disease. And that's what this large group of, of genes is over here. So each one of these might only contribute a very low risk itself, um, but maybe uh, fairly common within the disease. But suffice to say that what we're, what we're doing, our approach, is to study these sorts of genes up here uh, because, because we know that, that when they're mutated, they definitely cause the disease. Now, the sharp-eyed amongst you might also notice that some of the genes um, in here, LARP2, are also found in, in the fam uh, familial forces, forms and uh, also sort of uh, inhabit this middle ground here where it's, um, there's a little bit of uh, influence of both, where it's uh, reasonably common and fairly high risk. So, um, again, this is another busy slide, but I just wanted to use this to, to summarize, um, I think it's a very straightforward sort of summary about how the, uh, a large field essentially breaks into two camps for how we think about pathological causes. And essentially this. For a long time, the vast majority of the focus was on protein aggregation and protein degradation problems. Um, not surprising if under pathological exam, what you end up seeing are these protein aggregates. Okay? And then in more recent years, uh, partly from the contribution of uh, these studies like this, we've come to think about um, mitochondria and mitochondrial dysfunction also uh, contributing to the disease. But you can see all of these arrows flowing left and right and up and down. This is really to serve the purpose that uh, mitochondrial dysfunction has an impact on, on protein handling and vice versa. Um, so it's a complicated situation that we're trying to um, understand some of the basics uh, by using a simple system like FIDES. <clears throat> okay, so I, I don't, I, I usually spend a, a little more uh, time to sort of uh, sell the benefits of FIDES to, to an audience. I don't think I need to do that uh, in this context, so I think you're all on board with that. Um, but suffice to say a, a couple of quick things. Um, of course, they have a, a short life cycle and a short lifespan. We're thinking about an age-related disease, so that's useful for us. Many of the pathways are conserved, of course, you know about all of that. And we have a tremendous ability to do uh, genetic screening and, and genetic manipulations. But really, the, the point of this slide was to say a couple of things specifically for Parkinson's that you may or may not know. Um, that is that the, the fly brain has uh, specific dopamine uh, expressing neurons, the same type that are uh, primarily affected in the disease. But this is a really important point, I think, that um, when we're looking at the flies and looking at our genetic mutants, phenotypes that, are, that we see that aren't obviously uh, mirroring uh, a disease context, so this sort of non-disease-related tissues, can be tremendously informative about the basic cellular function of the genes that we're interested in. <clears throat> and you'll, you'll see the relevance of this as we go through. And again, just to briefly sort of say the overarching ethos in, in, in my lab, we're trying to understand really the most basic and conserved function of genes that we know that are linked to the disease. Okay? Um, and this doesn't have to be um, specifically sort of mirroring the disease context. A lot of people 
in the field sort of get hung up on this. That it needs to look like the human syndrome in a fly, but I think that's perhaps stretching it a little bit too far. One of the ways that we do this is that we, we let the strongest phenotypes tell us what are the most, most important, important uh, functions of a gene. And then, of course, we use the power of fly genetics for, for discovery about what those functions are. And I won't talk about this today, but we also do uh, appreciate that there are a simple in vivo model for um, testing drugs, essentially, testing the, the potential for uh, drug applications. OK, so just come back to the uh, list of genes that are um, relevant for Parkinson's disease. Uh, I'm not going to go through this. There's a lot of information here. But this is really just to suffice to say that there's, a, there's really a, a, a tremendous list now of genes that are solidly linked to causing Parkinson's. You can see that they're, they might be in autosomal dominant or autosomally recessed, uh, recessive inherited forms. Um, and the cell biology of what's been investigated hints at a, a number of common themes. You can see mitochondria here, of course, but then protein aggregation, autophagy, and, and uh, vesicle dynamics, and so on. Now, happily, for most of these genes, there is a fly homologue, so that means we can study that. Now, um, also, I think importantly, there are some notable exceptions. So the first gene, this is more or less in chronological order, by the way. The first gene linked to Parkinson's was alpha-synuclein back in 1997. So we've had 20 years of genetic research on, on Parkinson's. Um, and strikingly, there are no homologues of the synuclein family in flies. Flies don't need them. Um, but what we've been working on uh, most avidly, as well as a number of these other genes, are the genes Parkin and Pink1. So, <clears throat> um, I'm just going to uh, next describe, uh, sort of summarize uh, a large body of work that over about the last 10 years or so, which really defined, um, sort of set up for you what the model system is that, that we look at on a daily basis. So, um, I essentially, I started, started up this work by uh, defining the first, developing the first mutants in the fly Parkin gene in Leo Polank's lab in Seattle uh, from about 2001. Um, and then a number of other groups subsequently described uh, mutants for pink one. And uh, to summarize their phenotypes, uh, they look like this. So they're, they're viable, and they, they do have a slightly shortened lifespan. They look more or less normal. The sharp-eyed amongst you will also notice that they hold their wings in a slightly strange way. That will become relevant in a second. Looking at the, the brain and looking for specifically for the dopaminergic neurons, we can see that there is a, a, an age-related decline. So this is useful for us, though that sort of mirrors uh, the disease scenario somewhat. The more clinically-minded uh, of the field um, I tend to appreciate that aspect. And again, sort of uh, considering the, the disease scenario, we also have our assays for locomotive deficits. <clears throat> so we have assays for walking, climbing ability, and assays for flight. Uh, and these assays will, uh, you'll be meeting these a bit later on this afternoon in the practical session. <clears throat> And one of the things that we noticed early was that if you look in the thorax, of course, the thorax is almost entirely composed of uh, the muscles that, that power flight. And these were degenerates even in very young um, adult flies uh, with these, these vacuoles in the, in the center. And looking at the ultrastructural level, hopefully you can uh, uh, see this and appreciate the detail, uh, looking at the EM level of these flight muscles, the, the black blobs in between the, the muscle fibers and mitochondria. And the flight muscle is a really extraordinary uh, tissue because it's, it's so dense for mitochondria. And um, this is the first the thing that we noticed that was going wrong first. You can see you don't need to be an, an, an expert in mitochondria to see that this mitochondrion is looking really, really horrible and sick and vacuolated and so on. <clears throat> the final point over here is that um, Parkin and, and pink one mutant males are completely sterile. That was totally unexpected and don't think really has anything to do with the disease. Um, but this ha we studied this a little bit and defined what it was. And this also had to do with the, the maturation of, of uh, spermatid development. 
But what was striking um, in these really major phenotypes, we considered these fairly subtle, but these major phenotypes were pointing the way uh, to defining that a major function of pink one and Parkin was maintaining mitochondrial homeostasis. Okay. So this was uh, some time ago, but it was actually, um, and, and the field generally sort of accepts this, and we've, we've moved on, as I'll describe in a moment. But back in the day, this was fairly revolutionary stuff. People were generally thinking about protein aggregation, and that was the, the sole purpose, the sole point about the disease. And the fly models were pointing us in a different direction to follow up uh, how mitochondria are maintained and, and stay healthy and keep tissues healthy. So following on from sort of the description of the, the model system, um, of course you can apply the genetics. You have sort of uh, intuited that the mutants for Parkin and PINK1 look very similar, so they phenocopy, and you can, you can do the epistasis um, type of experiments. And the upshot of uh, a couple of really important studies that were published uh, some years ago was that if you take the PINK1 mutants, which have all of this disruption, and you simply overexpress Parkin, you can now uh, restore this fly almost back to normal. So this essentially set up the PINK1 and Parkin acting in a common pathway. And again, this was the first time that two genes that have been linked to familial uh, Parkinson's have been linked in a common pathway. And it was all down to the flies. Um, and it sort of essentially works that um, this uh, epistasis, that if you knock out PINK1 and you simply over-express and over-activate the pathway lower down, you can circumvent the, these upstream uh, issues. So these, these genetic uh, studies are tremendously powerful, of course, but they don't tell you, very, you, don't tell you anything else about uh, what composes the pathway or the, what the pathway is actually doing. And this is, just to remind me, uh, to tell you at this early stage that it was already known that Parkin is an E3 ubiquitin ligase uh, and that PINK1 um, is a, a clearly a mitochondrially targeted serine 3 and kinase. So <clears throat> I'm sort of uh, describing this, uh, um, this story in more or less chronological order as well to sort of lead you through how we, we went through the discovery process to bring us more up to date. Um, so after the sort of genetic interaction studies, um, it, it became clear that you could apply the standard genetic approaches that we do in flies, and of course one of those things is, is screening. So probably don't really need to go through this much, but uh, in genetic screening, of course, you take a cohort of identical flies, you apply mut mutagen, and of course you need an assay. So what we can do very easily, I just described to you that essentially the flies are flightless, we can put them into a, a flight assay. So uh, with our mutants, Pink and Parker mutants, they're flightless, so if you pop them into a tube testing flight, they'll all fall to the bottom, and if you do this enough times with enough graduate students uh, bearing along with you, then you'll find a rare genetic modifier. Now this is a, a tremendously important uh, lead into something that is telling you uh, what the main biology behind this phenotype really is. Okay. Um, to summarize an awful lot of work, one of the main things that we came up with from this sort of screening was uh, aspects of mitochondrial fission and fusion. Okay, so who here studies mitochondria? Is, that, is anyone sort of studying mitochondria? Okay, so you, you'll be aware of this, no doubt. Maybe not many of the other people in, in the room will. But um, I think one of the fascinating aspects of, of mitochondria um, that's come to light over about the last uh, 15, 20 years is that they're incredibly dynamic organelles. Of course, this has been advanced with... with tremendous uh, advances in, in microscopy and fluorescent reporters and so on. But here you can see um, an example. These are all fluorescently labeled mitochondria in a cell. And you can see an aspect of fusion there. And if you hover here for a second, this mitochondria will divide and they go their different ways. So this is a fusion and fission aspect of dynamics. We've also been interested in, in the past in how mitochondria move up and down neuronal processes in here an axon. So these, again, fluorescently labeled mitochondria going up and down these, these axons. And mitochondria also uh, 
dynamically interact with other organelles in the cell, such as the ER. And uh, this will be more the topic of uh, my second talk a bit later on. <clears throat> so to come back in a bit more detail to the fission and fusion aspect of, of dynamics, as you just, just saw that there's sort of a, a cycle of, of fission and fusion um, where two mitochondria can come together and fuse and a, a larger mitochondria can, can divide. This seems to be a cycle um, that's important for intermixing of components um, and generally sort of sharing out uh, um, how mitochondria act in a cell and are, um, how they move around and so on. And uh, a, a lot of work on the biochemistry of this has really defined the machinery really quite, quite exquisitely about how this cell biology works. And there's, there's a machinery that uh, is recruited to, to mitochondria to pinch these off, to divide them. This, these are DRP1, MFF, this one, and so on. And the machinery that's defined, uh, that acts in fusing two mitochondria together is also uh, very well defined. Mitofusins one and two on the outer membrane, and OPA1 seems to be primarily what's responsible in the inner membrane. <clears throat> and these, again, these have become uh, relevant a, a bit later on as well. So, um, I mentioned we, we genetically uh, linked fission and fusion, and the, the details worked out like this, such that if we increase the pro-fission factor DRP1, or decrease the pro-fusion factors OPA1 or mitofusin, this was sufficient to suppress the phenotypes. And some of the data looked like this. Thinking about our climbing assay now, here's a control, very poor uh, climbing ability for our, Parkin mut uh, our pink one mutants or our Parkin mutants. If we did some of these manipulations, overexpressed DRP1, very effective at rescuing this, or remove one copy of OPA1 or mitofusin, these are also suppressed. And this was borne out in the, in, in the muscle uh, integrity and the mitochondrial integrity. You can see, again, these vacuolated mitochondria um, in the flight muscle in the mutants. And this was really tremendously well restored by these genetic uh, manipulations. So what we're doing, of course, with these manipulations is driving the balance of fission and fusion towards more efficient, more fragmented mitochondria. And so, again... The outcome from these sorts of genetic studies was that whilst there's a, a, a cycle of fission and fusion, overall, if we promoted fragmentation, this was beneficial in, the, in, in these mutants. So subsequent to the genetic linkage, we were also able to define, I told you a moment ago, that, that Parkin is a ubiquitin ligase, uh, so this tags... Uh, cellular components with ubiquitin, and that's usually uh, a signal for that protein to be degraded by the proteasome. There are other, many other things that ubiquitin does, of course. Uh, but we were able to define that Parkin is actually responsible for ubiquitinating mitofusin on the outer surface and uh, regulating its levels. Such that in, so here's a western blot for, for mitofusin, uh, such that in the pink and Parkin mutants, we had ele elevated levels of mitofusin in both the larvae and the adult stage. <clears throat> so, this, so in normal conditions, of course, the interpretation of this is that uh, Pink and Parkin are acting to keep mitofusin levels a, a bit lower, keeping them down. So promoting, so rather inhibiting fusion and having the effect of promoting fission. So um, this is a few years ago that we sort of started to get these genetic interaction, genetic linkages. And it came along at the same time as a, a couple of really seminal studies from the cell biology field that I'll just describe uh, now. One of these was from uh, Orion Schurenheim's lab, where they were studying really the, the purpose of this fission and fusion cycle. So you've got this cycle of, of fission and fusion going on. And they noticed that um, after a certain uh, fission events, some of the mitochondria lost their membrane potential. This, of course, is a, um, a crucial feature of um, healthy acting mitochondria, having a membrane potential. And um, if they lost their membrane potential, then they were essentially siphoned off um, and degraded through the process of autophagy. Okay. Um, 
After these sorts of fission events, if some mitochondria lose their membrane potential temporarily, then they regain it, and then they can go back into the normal uh, network and fuse with others, and they're per working perfectly normally. But it was this idea that some of them um, get, get pulled away from the, uh, the network to be degraded that led um, Richard Yule's group, who were interested in um, the action of Parkin particularly, to think about this. And what they did, hopefully this is not projecting tremendously well, but I think you can get the idea. Um, they were looking at uh, a fluorescently tagged Parkin, which um, is fairly nondescript throughout the cytosol. And if you toxify mitochondria, if you destroy their membrane potential, thing back to over here, uh, using this chemical CCP, you could see that Parkin comes along uh, and decorates these mitochondria. So it, it comes along to depolarize mitochondria. And if you leave this chemical on for a really extended period, if you can't see this as this 12 hours and 48 hours, what happens is that the red marker is a, a marker for mitochondria, I should say, is that the, the mitochondria all get gathered together in a particular part of the cell, and then they get degraded by the process of autophagy. So this, is, this study in 2008 is what uh, really kick-started the field to be thinking about how Pink One and Parkin regulate uh, healthy mitochondria and ultimately send them off for degradation through autophagy. So this is the, the process that's known as uh, mitophagy. And I'll just go through this in a little bit more detail. So essentially to sort of summarize about the last 10 years worth of work on cell biology and biochemistry, what's come to light is that I told you that PINK1 is a mitochondrially targeted kinase, and so under healthy mitochondria, that means with a high membrane potential, that's what this symbol means, uh, PINK1 is, is uh, targeted to the mitochondria, it's internalized, uh, we also defined, using fly genetics, some of the proteases that are involved in the processing of mitochondria when it gets internalized, and then it's degraded. And Parkin is um, floating around in the cytosol doing some other jobs. Now, essentially, the purpose of this is as a constitutive switch-off signal. It's not needed, so we just dampen down, we, we degrade pink one, and um, the process is not triggered. But when we get a depolarized mitochondrion, this is now not able to take pink one inside the mitochondria, so it sticks on the outside. And this is where the <coughs> signal then gets triggered. <coughs> pink one is a kinase, so what does it phosphorylate? Um, so it was, it was discovered a few years ago that pink one phosphorylates both parkin and ubiquitin, um, and then this triggers a sort of a feed-forward cycle of um, uh, re triggering the recruitment of Parkin to the mitochondria, as I mentioned in the last slide, um, when you get this, st this stabilization of pink one on the mitochondrial surface, that triggers Parkin to come along. It provides ubiquitin on a whole range of, of outer membrane uh, proteins. Um, this ubiquitin is phosphorylated by pink one, and that serves as an extra substrate for, for Parkin and so on. So you get this feed forward cycle where um, the actions of pink one and Parkin end up decorating these mitochondria with phosphorylated ubiquitin. Okay. And so when you get these long tags of ubiquitin surrounding the mitochondria, that's now sufficient to be recognized by the, the autophagy machinery engulfed and gobbled up. <clears throat> now, um, I think it's, it's hard to overstate the, the impact that this, this idea has had on the Parkinson's field. Here's the Narendra et al. study of 2008, and this is, just gives a reflection of the numbers of papers that were uh, citing the word mitophagy uh, in, their, uh, in their study. And since then, this is, there's been an explosion in the interest of, of, of mitophagy, in, particularly in the, uh, the cause of Parkinson's disease. And it's quite understandable that this is a, an extremely attractive um, notion. I told you at the beginning that mitochondrial dysfunction and mitochondrial problems had been linked to, to Parkinson's disease for a long time. 
It's also linked to many other neurodegenerative diseases. And one of the, the reasons is that, of course, inside mitochondria, where primary uh, process is to produce energy, and it does this by um, reducing oxygen. Um, and a consequence of using oxygen in that process is the production of reactive oxygen species. Um, this is often one of the key culprits in the sort of uh, invoking oxidative stress and oxidative damage in these age-related diseases because it can damage all manner of macromolecules. Okay? And of course, what you want to do if your mitochondrion is damaged is you want to sequester this and degrade it nice and safely because what you don't want to have happen is, uh, for, for example, the outer membrane to be ruptured because I'm sure you, you know, thinking back to sort of undergraduate uh, um, uh, mitochondria biology, you know that this houses a whole slew of pro-apoptotic machinery. And so that's going to, if this happens in a neuron, that's going to be all over for that neuron, neurodegeneration and cell death. So this process of, of mitophagy is a tremendously attractive uh, mechanism to explain why you get these problems and, and how they're uh, maintained in the first place. So the key thing that we've been trying to address in the last few years is um, in that explosion of interest in mitophagy in the field, almost all of this has been done in uh, cultured cells. So how much of this is really relevant to the disease, and particularly in vivo? So as I, as I alluded to, most of the studies have used, are using mitochondrial poisons or these depolarizing chemicals. So that's non-physiological, of course, but it's a, it's a model system. They're using cell lines, which, um, if anyone has experience of using these, you'll know that they're largely glycolytic. Okay, they tend to be... Uh, uh, derived from uh, cancer-type situations. They're heavily glycolytic, so they don't really need their mitochondria. And almost all of the studies which show mitophagy uh, do this in the context of Parkin overexpression. So what's really happening in, in vivo? The questions that we really need to address are, you know, where this is happening, when, how much. Um, and of course, in contrast to the way that we model it in cells, what's the physiological stimulus? If this is happening, Really, what's triggering it? <clears throat> and to date, there's really very little evidence that uh, has been found that this is actually happening in vivo. One of the um, rather tricky points, I think, is that if, if this process of mitophagy is so tremendously important for maintaining healthy mitochondria and healthy neurons, I haven't told you about this yet, but knockout mouse models for Parkin and Pink one have almost nothing wrong with them, okay, even uh, to extreme age. So it was at this point we sort of decided that we needed some good uh, report alliance for mitophagy. <clears throat> so this is a, a study that we've, uh, we published just uh, um, a few weeks ago that we've been working on for a little while. And it really came on the back of uh, a couple of reporter lines that had been described in, uh, in cell culture. And we, we adapted those to use those in flights. So essentially, we used a couple of systems. One of them is called MitoQC. And it works. Uh, it's a very simple base system. It's a tandem uh, fusion of an M-cherry and a GFP that is then targeted to the mitochondrial outer, outer membrane. Um, now... This sort of exploits a characteristic that in the cytosol, uh, in, in neutral pH conditions, um, M-cherry and GFP fluoresce as normal, but in the lysosome, essentially the end point of autophagy, where they get degraded in the, the lysosome, lysosome is very acidic, um, and uh, GFP is quenched, but M-cherry is not, or it's quenched a bit slower, degraded a bit slower. So you get this, this shift from a fluorescence uh, emission, um, sort of a, a green and red on the normal mitochondria. And then when those mitochondria or those mitochondria components make their way to the lysosome for degradation, you see this as red only. Okay. So you can sort of appreciate this um, in these little red dots <coughs> that um, are separate from the green. 
I said we, we, use a, we adapted a couple of systems. One was MitoQC, the other one was called MitoKyma. And it works on a very similar sort of principle, but this is a, a single um, uh, fluorophore called Chyma that is sensitive to pH. And I won't go through the details, but essentially the, um, the fluorescent spectra shifts from a, a neutral pH when it's, it's uh, fluorescing uh, more in the red sort of uh, spectrum, at, uh, acidic pH, lysosomes, it shifts to be more red. So it's basically the same sort of idea as the mitochondria. <clears throat> but having a, a nice reporter system means that we can approach these sorts of things in, in tissues and flights. Now, just a couple of uh, uh, really very simple but very important um, validations of this system. Um, we found that the, the, both the MitoQC and the MitoKyma did localize the mitochondria, so the system was uh, working, uh, appeared to be working nicely in flies once we'd, we'd made these UAS constructs. Uh, I should also say that these, these cells that we're looking at here are epidermal cells of the, the larval um, body wall. And a really important part was when we're, we end up looking at these red dots, um, we need to know that they really are uh, mitochondria components that are in the lysosome. So we found that these um, uh, co-localize with lysotracker very nicely. So we were happy that the, the system was working nicely. But we were a bit afraid we might end up seeing very subtle uh, phenotypes. So we wanted to make this uh, uh, define a very quantitative uh, method for looking at, at this mitophagy aspect. So we turned to using this Imaris software, um, and essentially what, just very briefly, I'll describe to you how this works. If we take a, um, a reasonably low mag image uh, uh, from, of the epidermal cells, in the software you can isolate a cell, you can then adjust the, um, uh, the GFP signal to remove some of the background. And then this software doesn't come across tremendously well here. But what this software allows you to do, if you've taken a Z stack of your image, it allows you to make a three-dimensional framework uh, which really defines the mitochondrial network, okay? The normal mitochondrial network. So what you can do is you take your, your little red dots signal and you extract uh, all of the, the, the red signal that co-localizes with the normal mitochondrial network, and you're left with just a few little red dots. So that's what we define as the mitolysosome. Okay. Now, I sort of labored this point a little bit because I think this is tremendously important. We put a lot of work into this to try and make this really accurately quantifiable. Okay. And you'll see why uh, in a moment. So in the end, what you can do is define the three-dimensional network, and hopefully what you can appreciate in this light is that um, we can see a few of these little tiny red dots, which we are considering are those parts of the mitochondrial network and which are now being degraded. Okay, so that's the mitophagy that we see in vivo. <clears throat> we also wanted to, to just check that these reporter systems respond in an appropriate way. Um, it had previously been defined that the MitoQC uh, uh, increases uh, the response of mitophagy to this uh, chemical deferoprone, and uh, we were able to feed the, the flies deferoprone, and we saw an increase in the mitophagy mitolysosomes. And using RNAi approaches, we knocked down um, a canonical uh, component of autophagy, ATG5, and we saw this reduce the number of, of uh, myelolysis. So, we're quite happy with the, the way these re reporter systems work, so we wanted to apply them to our, our Pink and Parkin uh, mutant animals. Remember that there's been a huge amount of literature uh, studying mitophagy, and that explosion of the interest in, uh, in mitophagy for Parkinson's disease, we were anticipating seeing a really dramatic effect when we have null mutants for these components that um, are so important in this mitophagy process. So what did we see? Well, looking in our pink and parking mutants, to our surprise, we saw that there's really no difference in the number of mitolysosomes. So this was larval tissues, again looking at our larval epidermis. Um, just to complete the picture, this is looking at 
QC, and this is looking at mitochondria, uh, which look very, very similar. So we wanted to move on to, to looking at adult structures. So we're looking in the, the adult brain, um, a sort of a very medial kind of position here. And again, we saw that there was really no difference between alkaline quine and Parkinson's and controls. We turned finally to, to, to look at um, the disease-relevant tissue, looking back at our dopaminergic neurons that I spoke about earlier. And again, we could detect mitophagy, but there was no difference uh, with the pink Parkinson's. So just to change tack a little bit, we've been looking at these tissues uh, which were disease relevant and we may have expected uh, mitophagy uh, and didn't see much difference. <clears throat> so we wanted to sort of switch it around and look in a, a system where we knew that pink and parkin had a profound effect. So thinking about the flight muscle that I, I spoke about earlier. And again, to reiterate, flight muscle is an incredibly um, energetic tissue and extremely abundant in mitochondria. So we might expect, if this is really super important uh, process for maintaining a healthy mitochondrial collection within a tissue, we might expect mitophagy to appear here, but we didn't. We couldn't find any evidence of, of mitophagy in this flight muscle. <coughs> so we don't, we don't quite understand this, um, but this is, these are the findings of, of uh, a recent study that had strong predictions from the rest of the field. So to summarize this little part, so we generated the first report alliance for, uh, to monitor mitophagy in flies. Very happy to share this with the rest of the field so they can study this as well. Um, and we found that basal mitophagy uh, occurs in various tissues, but at different levels in various tissues. Okay, so we know there's a dynamic process, and that's understandable. But very surprisingly, our knockout mutants for pink and parking had no influence on this. And this is a, a, a really a big surprise. I think um, hopefully this is going to get the field to think a bit more about uh, the, the correlation between what we see in cultured cells to what's actually going on uh, in an in vivo tissue. And just to sort of drive this point home, our paper uh, came along at the same time as, as another paper from uh, Tom McWilliams and Ian Ganley's group, uh, where they were studying the same reporter system, actually it was MitoQC, and they came up with exactly the same outcome, looking at the PINK1 mutants, where uh, basal mitophagy was, was not affected by loss of pink in mouse tissue. So this raises questions, of course, is why is this? We certainly weren't expecting this from the outset. Um, we can offer up a, a, a couple of suggestions um, that perhaps there's, there's another mode of uh, mitophagy that can compensate. One, uh, another ubiquitin ligase that's been suggested to act in this way is, is called MOL1. We're in the process of um, investigating that at the moment. Or there's another completely independent Parkin, pink Parkin independent mode. Of course, what, we, what we've been studying here is basal mitophagy. So perhaps what Pink and Parkin are doing only gets activated under a specific uh, condition, such as, such as ROS, but such as uh, mitochondrial DNA mutations. So we're also studying this at the moment. So we don't have any uh, mature data on that yet. Um, but I'll just come back to, to show this, um, this figure here that summarizes um, a number, it's taken from a really nice review here, that summarizes a number of um, mechanisms that there are for mitochondrial quality control along the way. So these are early stages of, of monitoring uh, mitochondrial proteins, and they can be extracted and degraded um, individually. What I've been talking about, of course, with this mitophagy is the very end point when you get a totally dysfunctional mitochondria that needs to be degraded. Now, what's in between this is this process you might have seen on an earlier slide of the mitochondrial dynamics, this process of vesicles budding off. Now, this is a little bit controversial in the field, um, but it's been described by, uh, primarily by Heidi McBride's group and Ted Farn um, that Pink and Parkin can act in this process of, of budding off these vesicles. Now, I happen to think that this is probably the more relevant aspect of, of where Pink and Parkin are, are, are acting. Not really this uh, end point that is, is so dramatically modeled in the uh, um, cell culture systems. 
And the question really um, now is whether our reporter systems are appropriate um, or capable uh, of um, being able to monitor this kind of degradation process. These would be very, very small vesicles that part of mitochondria. So that's something we're, we're investigating currently. Okay, so, so to conclude this talk, and I'll tell you another little story uh, a bit later on. Um, to date, I think it's fair to say that this was spurred on by the original studies in the fly models, that there's overwhelming evidence that pink and parkin act to uh, regulate mitochondrial homeostasis. And what I've uh, tried to drive home the point today, one of the ways we think that they do this is by affecting mitochondrial dynamics, and pink and parkin are strongly linked to this toxin-induced mitophagy, although the in vivo evidence is, is very scant, and we think there's probably um, our recent um, Evidence means that this needs to be revised, what we think uh, is the mechanism. So we developed the first uh, mitophagy reporters and uh, started to put these to use and found no impact of, of pink parking on, on this basal mitophagy. <clears throat> so um, I think the final, the final word that I want to, to say on this is that I think there is, there is some evidence in vivo to support that... Um, there is mitophagic turnover. I can talk more about uh, this individually if anyone who's interested in this. Um, but I think that it's probably more of a piecemeal uh, approach rather than this whole degradation and gobbling up of mitochondria. <clears throat> okay, so that's the story that I wanted to, to tell this morning. Um, and I'll come back to tell something else a little bit later on. And this is, this is my group, of course. Uh, the, so Juliet Lee is uh, the student who's been working on the mitophagy reporters that I described at the end, and Alvaro Sanchez Martinez has, has been in my group a long time working on a lot of the genetics and mitochondrial dynamics stuff. Um, so thank you for your attention. I don't know if there's any questions you want to ask now, feel free, otherwise grab me at some point in the day and I'll be talking with you um, again this afternoon. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.